Quickly, I'm going to introduce, I'm Janet Cannon with the Friends of the Library. Our president is Karen Hafner, Wave Karen. Um, we are sponsoring this program and we always love to have new members. Uh, we support the library by paying for museum passes and special reading programs and all kinds of stuff and programs like this. So I think Karen put some information at the bottom of the screen like she did last time, hopefully. I will. <laughs> and, um, I'm admitting someone else in. So I want to introduce Lindsay Kurt, who is our speaker. I can't and hear you. She's a marine biologist. Yes. Um, she's, a, she's a science educator focusing on the environment. Um, she is co-founder of the Northern Hall School, the Infinite Classroom, which creates tailored teaching opportunities. And um, she's a wonderful guide on whale watches. That's how I met her. And Molly was with me, too. And um, so I'm going to turn this over to Lindsay. Who you should wave so everybody knows who you are. <laughs> um, so welcome, everybody. I'm super happy to see you here, <laughs> even if it is not exactly in person. Um, I'd like to ask that just ahead of time, if you are not on mute right now, please go ahead and bonk your button on the lower left-hand corner to make sure you're on mute so that I don't pick up background noise of, you know, some dog squeaking a toy or something. <laughs> Be kind of crazy. Right. Um, you're, you'll be welcome to open up your mic later if you have questions um, and you are welcome at any time to throw some questions in the chat. But I'm going to leave plenty of room for people to ask questions um, at the end of this. And uh, if your name is not listed right now on your Zoom, feel free to introduce yourself or you can introduce yourself anyway in the chat if you like. I see you up there, iPhone 11. That must be Autumn, right? Hi. So welcome everybody. Once again, uh, my name is Lindsay. Thank you, Janet, for the intro. This is actually part two of a two-part Zoom series um, in, in collaboration with the Rockland Memorial and Library, uh, Rockland Memorial Library out of Massachusetts. Um, it is sponsored by the Friends of the, of the Rockland Memorial Library. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, if you happen to make it to the first Zoom that we had, which was a couple of weeks ago. Um, you may remember that I talked about uh, mostly humpback whales. You guys remember this one right over here with the big long airplane wings for, for uh, flippers. Um, we talked quite a lot about the humpback whale, but I also introduced some other types of whales. If you recall and you were there, you may remember that whales are pretty much separated and grouped uh, by how they eat. So the stuff that's in their mouth. So some whales like belugas and orca whales or killer whales have teeth in their mouth and they grab one bit of food at a time or one large uh, chunk of food at a time. And our humpback whales are filter feeders known as uh, uh, filter feeders known as baleen uh, they have in their mouths. So we talked a little bit about that and I'm not gonna go back to that a lot unless anybody has any questions, but I did just wanna remind where we came from. We learned about the anatomy, all the different parts of the whale, how they're shaped uh, fusiform, kind of like an airplane. And they're made to glide through the water and they're just beautiful, amazing creatures. But today we're gonna talk about how we know who's who. So if you don't mind me, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and bring up a couple of photos. So here we go. Um, if you can see the screen, you can go ahead and give me a thumbs up, either a real one, or you can just thumbs up directly from your chat. So once again, if you're just joining us, my name is Lindsay Hurt. I am the Friendly Neighborhood Marine Biologist and Local Naturalist from Plymouth, Massachusetts. I have friends far and wide who also love whales and there are whales all over the world. They're what we call circumglobal. Uh, what that means is that they swim in every ocean. So tonight I'm only talking about the humpback whales, the baleen or filter feeding species that come to this area. Um, there are many, many populations of humpback whales all over the world, uh, depending on which scientists you talk to, about 14 or 16 or so um, uh, populations of the, of the humpback whale. But the ones that I'll be talking about tonight are the Gulf of Maine or, or New England whales. And what we're gonna be looking at is how we know who's who. So welcome to the talk. All right. Uh, I want to remind everybody, if you were here last time or introduce you this time, if you don't know an area called 
Stell Wagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. It is one of uh, 14 protected waterways in the United States where some amazing creatures either go and, and live all year round or they migrate there. They come for a portion of the season for a specific reason. Uh, I have to admit of all of the ways that I have seen uh, nature and all the places that I've gone in the world to look at wildlife, the absolute best time I've ever had and the most amazing way to see creatures has been to be naturally. So this is my favorite place. Uh, my, the office at which I work is a boat called the Tales of the Sea. Like that's tales, not tales like a book. And uh, the Tales of the Sea is owned by Captain John Boats, which is one of the many amazing, responsible whale watching companies that goes out to this area known as Stellwagen Bank uh, to visit the humpback whales in the spring, summer, and fall. So that's just the time that we are lucky enough to get whales like this. And if you're in a smaller boat or, oops, accidentally in the water, you might get a view a little bit like this. So this is me up here um, before an eight inch haircut. Uh, looking out at whales, can you guys see the whales in the water there? There's at least one over there. You can give a thumbs up if you can see that whale. Mostly what you're gonna get is just a small poof, what looks like a small poof of, of air um, going into the sky. That's the spout or what we like to call the blow of the whale as they come to the surface and take a big breath. So this is sort of another angle um, of a whale from our water here in Stellwagen Bank. And those of you that are, are just joining us, I see that there's a whole bunch of people coming in. Um, if you're just joining us, once again, my name is Lindsay Hurt, and I'm here tonight to talk about whales. I'm a naturalist from Plymouth, Massachusetts. Some of you may know the area from, that's where the pilgrims first landed in 1620. And right next door is that hook-shaped peninsula, Cape Cod. We're gonna talk about it right now. So, as I said, humpback whales, like many other whales, do live in many different oceans and all over the world. But I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction of where the humpback whales that I like to watch and that we study off the coast of Massachusetts, where they come to. So uh, if you're living on the East Coast, which I'm pretty sure most of you are, because you pretty much all live locally, right? Thumbs up if you're mm -hmm. local. So you know, of course, when you go to the edge of the ocean, you're seeing the Atlantic Ocean. Well, you may not go hundreds and hundreds of miles out. You might just stand on the shore and look out to sea. If you do that and you live on Cape Cod, you're gonna be looking at Cape Cod Bay. If you're way up towards our little city where everybody drinks Duncan, then you're probably looking into an area called Massachusetts Bay. If you take a boat and like on a day trip, I'm talking a couple of hours to maybe six hours, then you're going to step into that protected uh, space that we were talking about. And that area is called Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. That's what the NMS is. So that area is extra special. And the reason why is because it's, it's kind of like a lifted platform. Uh, the water there is fairly shallow because years and years ago, there was this incredible glacier that blew down from the north to about two miles wide, or two miles thick, I should say. And eventually, when our climate changed, that ice melted and left behind a whole lot of debris and sand behind, and of course, filled up all of the depression areas with water, uh, Cape Cod Bay, Massachusetts Bay, and allowed the, the level of water to rise in our ocean, giving us a deeper Atlantic Ocean. Um, so that that sand that was left behind kind of made something sort of like a mountain with the top cut off, um, what you might know as a mesa if you like those spaghetti Western movies. Uh, and that space is a really great space because it's kind of like a big tabletop with steep, steep sides. And so you get this incredible, um, interesting type of environment there where there's all kinds of deep, uh, water, cold water that floats to the top up those steep sides and brings with it all of the amazing nutrients that uh, sort of float to the bottom of the ocean. And they end up spreading across this big square that you see here stretched uh, next door to the state of Massachusetts, and it, it kind of fertilizes the water. So what you get is shallow water that the sunlight can penetrate 
deep into the water and you get a lot of fertile water that's highly oxygenated, it's cooler water. And because of all these factors coming together, the sunlight, the nutrients, the shape of the land, the, the geographical features underneath the water, you get this fantastic environment for things like whales to come and what do you think they like to do? Eat. They like to eat. So because of that, we get this migration of this amazing population of humpback whales that comes each and every year. And they might not have one exact GPS point that they like to go. Like they don't, they don't like to take out their phone and ask Alexa or put it on Google, but they do have a general sense of where they wanna go. And when they get here, they say, oh, it's time for me to fill up my stomach because they've got to gain lots and lots of weight in order to have enough fuel in their tank or enough blubber in their body, enough calories for them to do all the things that it takes to be a whale. Things like traveling hundreds of miles all the way from the warm waters of the Caribbean. And also to do things like give birth to babies the size of a minivan. So it takes a lot of work to do that. It's very energy expensive. And so they make this journey to a place where there's plentiful fish that are here because of the nutritious waters off the coast of Massachusetts. So that's why they like to come. So uh, these humpback whales, so we were just talking about the migration, they, they come to this area that we call the Gulf of Maine, this, this area in the Atlantic, all the way from the Caribbean waters where they like to spend their winters. And we love to, to, we get really excited about seeing them when they come back each and every year. So this is one view, and we actually showed this picture last time. You'll see a couple of repeats from last time, just to jog your memory if you were part of our group last time. Um, these pictures can be really confusing when you first see them, but if you remember, our whale is shaped kind of like an airplane, fusiform, where they sort of have smooth sides and long bodies, and then there's a dorsal fin sticking out. Of the dorsal is like the back, your back, on top of the body, and then these long airplane wings that you see out to the side here, those are the pectoral flippers that uh, stick out from the shoulder joints of the whale and help them with things like directionality and a propulsion to allow them to swim forward. So um, I really love this picture. And the reason why is because this, this big 50 foot long whale, which is about half the size of the tails of the sea boat that I like to work on, um, it shows how nutritious and how full of life the waters here in New England are. This picture was taken in Stellwagen Bank and of course there's two whales here, but the thing that's so exciting about it is that you see this, this sort of day glow action happening here. Most of our, our humpback whales actually have fairly close to white flippers in our area, our population. And these don't look white at all, do they? They look like they're kind of day glow or bright green. And the reason why is because the water is just filled with plankton. All that life I was talking about from the, the nutrients and the oxygen and the sunlight, it grows an amazing aquatic garden. And that is the basis of the food source of all the little fishes and small organisms that our, our humpback whales like to eat. There's so many of them that they actually turn white whale skin green when you look in the water. So that's, that's kind of cool. So one of the things that I like the most uh, about the humpback whales is that they can easily be tracked. I guess that's probably the wrong word. Easily is probably not the right word to say. I would say um, they're, they're well understood and they're well uh, studied and they're my favorite species because they can be tracked by their tail patterns. Now, this is different from most of our other whales who, if you look at some of their scars or markings on their bodies, you can kind of get a sense if those whales visit the space that you, that you take up um, readily, but they might not have a specific birthmark or a pigmentation to their skin that you can say, there's no doubt about it. I know who that whale is. And the interesting thing about the humpback whales is that the underside of their tails have a very exact birthmark. And I use that term loosely um, because what the birthmark that we're looking at can actually change a little bit over time. But what we see is a variation in color there, a pigmentation. And that pigmentation can vary from 
very white to very black and anything in between. So today, what I'd like to do with you is to be able to show you uh, many of the different tales that I see, or another word for them is fluke, fluke or the whale tail, um, so that you can get a sense of the many differences that we see and how naturalists and captains and scientists all like to, to share information and track these animals because that's one of the things that makes them so special and such a different species than others. We get to learn about them just by recognizing them through their tails or their flukes. So let's have a look. Here's an example right here. Um, for those of you who are, who are naturalists yourselves, if, if anybody is, um, Amy Tudor, I think I saw you on here, welcome. Um, uh, you, you may recognize mother and calf pairs, and I love this picture because it's just, it's just full of action. Um, this is actually a mom and baby, or cow-calf pair, and the, the cow, her name is Dross. She's here in the background. That's the mom. She's got a big tail, about 15, 16 feet wide. Um, this was about halfway through the season last year. Her baby was about six months old, and uh, the baby is actually, it's very... Uh, confusing sometimes unless you have a point of reference the baby whale or the calf is actually much much closer so the, the calf is in the foreground so it looks like the tail is pretty big it's actually not that big in comparison to mom but it's a, a very interesting thing to be able to know if you can tell who the mom and the baby is then in the future you have an opportunity to re sight or re-see the calf again as a grown-up and say I know who your mom is. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit how about how we track that. So here is a nice up close action shot um, of a humpback whale doing what we call a fluking dive. Now I talked a lot about the body parts of the whale and how the form follows the function of, of the animal in our last, um, our last discussion. So just to give you a quick model of that, if you can see, can most of you see me in the corner over here talking? Hopefully you can. Um, our humpback whales, again, sort of airplane or fusiform shaped, they are a little chubby and tubby. We want them to be because the more fat or blubber they have in the body, the more energy they have, but they have these big long wings. There are flippers that they have to help them glide through the water uh, like angel wings. And as they begin to dive, they tip their body and their tail bends. And they do this action typically very slowly. Now, when I say slowly, I don't mean like for 45 minutes and we're waiting until they lift their tail. It, it does happen when there's a flow to it. But a lot of times what you see is a hump hump back or a curve of the body before the whale uh, sort of dives into the water. And the last part to come out is that tail or the fluke. And the fluke is where we get all of our information, so to speak. So this can be tough to get because we're not looking directly at the whale's tail uh, at this time, we're looking from the side. So some of these uh, pictures that we take or sites that we get can be a little on the tricky side, but that's pretty much the view that we get when we're looking on the water. So here's a better example. Now, I, I wanna let you know before I show you um, these photos that as a naturalist, um, I've seen a lot of whales for you know, a couple of decades now, and my camera compared to most of my colleagues is absolutely terrible. So when you see some of the photos that I have on here tonight and you say, wow, that's really close to a whale. Yes, I do have zoom, but oftentimes the whale is wiggling. <laughs> the boat is wiggling. There's a lot of wind, there's wave, there's, um, changes in the weather, there's lighting problems, there's glare. Um, in my book, this is actually a terrible photo for quality of this whale. Um, but what I like about it is that it shows very specific parts about the whale because it's directly head on. So what you're seeing is the, not the top or the dorsal part of the whale, you're seeing the underside or the, the ventral side of the whale. So as if the whale was on its belly um, and you can see the underside of the tail, that's the ventral portion or the fluke. And we have a very specific pattern here. So this whale was named eruption. And I gave you an example here of 
an eruption from a volcano um, because of all this sort of cloudy, dark, smoky look um, that there's a really distinct line here that we can see on this whale's tail or fluke that sort of reminds us of sort of a smoky eruption. So that's why this whale was named this way. This whale has been seen for a lot of years. In my first uh, year of professional whale watching with Captain John, which was um, 2015, I, I have logged in my book have, having seen this whale at least 20 times. So this is a, a common visitor uh, to Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, or what I shall call a true Cape Cotta, if I may. So this is one example of um, a commonly seen whale with an interesting name that maybe it takes you a second, but it kind of gives you a reminder. Here's another whale um, that I have seen sort of frequently on Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. The whale is named Rapier, which is kind of sounds like an old fashioned word and you might not know what it means. Well, I put a picture right in the corner there. If you've ever seen the Three Musketeers, you might know that they had a lot of sword fights. And in those times, the swords were long, thin, and sharp. And if you look here on the left lobe of the underside of the tail, you can see what looks like a long, thin sword. Does everybody see that? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Yeah, it can be a tough one though. Sometimes they're sort of hidden. What if you only saw this side of rapier? It might be hard to recognize. So what's nice to have is an identification picture where you have rapier's whole tail. So then you can say, if you see another weird mark, like over here, there's kind of a strange swoopy X. If you just saw this part, you might be able to match that to a photo of rapier that you know you already have. And in that way, you can sort of match up some of the points. Now, the average naturalist is going to say, I need five points that look exactly the same to be able to say that this is definitely the same whale. So I'll give you another example. Here is a whale named Samara. And a lot of people actually don't know what a, a Samara is, uh, but if you have ever had a maple tree in fall and you've seen the leaves flutter to the ground, you might remember those little winged doohickeys that uh, have seed pods in them. They sort of flutter to the ground like little helicopters. Well, Here's one right here on Samara's tail. Can you see that on that right side there? Sort of an interesting kind of pattern there. And at this moment in time, her tail looks a little curved, but when she's straight up and down, which I don't have a great picture of, um, you can really easily see that maple leaf pattern. And that is called a Samara. So that's why she was named that way. Here is one of my favorite whales of all time. And for very obvious reasons, if you're looking at the picture, her name is Owl. Um, what I don't love and what's not my favorite thing about this picture actually is that she is in the middle of defecating or pooping in this picture. But it was the best and closest picture that I had of Owl so that you could see the two bright spots on either side of her tail that are reminiscent of an owl. So give me a thumbs up if you can see that owl in there. She's a really obvious one. Um, and if you look closely at the change in color and the water underneath her, um, there's a lot of brown going on in that water. Owl had a very nice feed. And then shortly after, she was able to relieve herself quite readily in the water right in front of our boat. So kind of interesting there. I'm going to break in here and um, say if any of you are just joining us, uh, I'm sorry that I'm talking about a whale pooping right now, but my name is Lindsay Hurt and I'm a marine biologist and whale watch naturalist off the coast of Massachusetts uh, in Cape Cod and Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And I'm very happy to have you uh, join me tonight with this uh, part two of Whale Tales sponsored by Rockland Memorial Libraries, um, the Friends of the Rockland Memorial Library. So thank you for being here. Feel free to add yourself into the chat if you would like to um, hear more about whales or if you have specific questions, because I promise you, I will get to Q&A. So welcome if you're just joining us. And speaking of which, uh, another of the fan favorites, who's ever experienced an echo in a big empty building or a cave or 
Bryce Canyon National Park. I'm sure you've all heard and know what an echo is. Am I right? Give me a thumbs up if you do. I'll take them. You bet. You've all heard an echo, but you probably haven't seen an echo, right? We're talking about sounds here. And so of course I had to make sure I added another little reference picture in the corner here. Totally Wikipedia guys. I didn't like make any of these extra little photos that I'm tucking in with our whale tail IDs here, but you get the idea. And of course, I hope you can get a really good sense on the left hand side of the whale tail or fluke here. That looks a lot like an echo to me, doesn't it? So that's a, a marking on Echo's tail. Now, Echo is another really, really good example of sort of a common looking uh, fluke pattern with the white on either side of the, um, on the lobes and more black in the middle. Um, sometimes you will have the opposite coloration pattern where there's more white in the middle and black on the outsides, or they have what I like to call eyeliner, which is really just a black all around the edges and more white in the middle. And sometimes we have entirely black tails. Those can even be sort of the toughest ones to be able to see. But echo is a good example of, of sort of a common pattern. We have dark in the middle and white in the sides. And here's that echo pattern. If you look really closely on the left side, can anybody see what is stuck to the side of echo's tail? up here in the left-hand corner. Anyone knows what that is? If you do, throw it in the chat. I would love to hear about it and talk about it later because it's gonna come up again. And then here is Echo again on a much rougher day, but a straight forward shot of the underside of the fluke. And of course, here you can see it again, that Echo pattern. It looks a little different if I back it up again, See how this almost looks like she has a different shaped tail or this is sort of shorter and wider. It all depends on what angle that you're looking at and also the conditions of the environment. It is lovely to go whale watching in the summertime when it's a perfect 78 degrees with a cool breeze in the water and a shiny, sunny, clear day. And then it's another thing entirely where you have a day like, like I had with eruption when it was very choppy and there was a lot of going up and down in the boat and there were a couple people who were turning a little bit green and things like that. So yeah, that's Echo twice. I'll give you one more comparison of one of my other favorite whales. Um, this is a whale named Nile. She's super famous, super, super famous. Thomas, Amy, I know you guys know who Nile is. I personally have been following this whale since I was a wee bit five years old. <laughs> and that's about uh, a, a Niles in her mid thirties too, we think so. Um, she's actually only a couple years away from me. I forget the, her birth date, but uh, she was, uh, I think 1987, I wanna say, 1986 or seven. Um, don't quote me on that because I do not have my catalog in front of me, but uh, Niall is a similar age to me. I have grown up with her and every single year since age five, I have taken the opportunity to go whale watching in Stellwagen Bank uh, with different companies, Captain John Boats, um, Sea Salt Charters, uh, Seven Seas Whale Watch, uh, the Dolphin Fleet with the Center of Coastal Studies in Provincetown, uh, the Hyannis Whale Watcher out of Barnstable Harbor and all of these places, all these boats, I should say, have gone to the area known as Stellwagen Bank, uh, sought out humpback whales, and every single year that I have been whale watching, which is not all since I was five, but most, every single year I've had the opportunity to see this gal. And the way that I know her is right here on the left-hand side. Some of you might think of that as kind of a lightning bolt, but with the reference on the right side here, the Nile River, you can kind of see how it kicks out right in this area. And it kicks out over here, right in this area and branches off. You can see the branch off. I don't know who the brilliant person to name this whale was, but Niall, she is, and she's easily recognizable. And I just find it amazing that there are over 90 species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Humpbacks are just one of them. There are uh, about a dozen and a half populations of them. They exist all over the world. Some of the populations are more endangered or rare and have only hundreds in them. And some have 
many, many thousands. And this is just one whale, one whale, like a drop in the ocean, one whale. And she's been seen over and over again to the point where she's famous and people know who she is and they follow her. And that to me is just, it just blows my mind. It's incredible. All because of this marking over here where people said, I know who that is. That's Nile. It's pretty amazing, right? Pretty amazing. So here's another example of Nile. And you actually see a little bit more of her tail in this area here, which we call the, the tail uh, stalk. You can sort of barely see it. Um, that's the joint where the tail connects with the rest of the spine. Um, the tail stalk has a lot more muscle to it and allows the a whale to propel themselves forward with really powerful thrusts and do incredible body activity, like jump into the sky in a, in a beautiful breach or belly flop onto the water. Um, pretty incredible. But there, of course, you can see there's no doubt about it. Even with a camera from a mile away, Nile is easily recognizable. So she's a pretty incredible whale. Now, I have work for you to do, everybody because all good teachers give something, right? So I have made a smash up of some, unfortunately for you, terrible pictures of humpback whale flukes. Okay, I, I made these fuzzy and um, uh, took them on bad weather days and in movement and sort of defuzzed them on purpose and scrambled them up. And I'm asking you where you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pictures here, how many individuals do you see? So what that means is there might be multiples of different whales here. So have a look at this picture, take a minute or two, and you tell me in the chat, or if you're joining us on live stream on Facebook, I would love to see what you have to say there. It is amazing how even People who have been whale watching a long time and have an excellent eye might get something like this wrong. And it's also amazing how there's wonderful beginner's luck and sometimes you just get it right. So have a peek. There are seven photos here, but are there seven whales? Maybe, maybe not. Let me check out some of your guesses. Six, five, four, 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 six. Good, I'm glad to see you're guessing. If you're feeling like you have an idea and you've already guessed, you can go ahead and give me a thumbs up. I'm gonna wait about 10 more seconds. And then I'm gonna scramble our pictures a little bit again. And I'm gonna give you the answer. Are you guys ready for it? Mm -hmm. All right. So the answer is four. Congratulations to the majority of you. And if you didn't get that right, especially if this is your first time thinking about and talking about whale tails, which can be a very confusing and um, mm -hmm. eye-boggling ordeal <laughs> uh, that don't feel bad because in my humble opinion, you're going to have plenty of chances throughout your life to guess. So I've scrambled the pictures a little bit and sort of uh, stretched them out a little wire, wider so you can see uh, more parts of them. And I'm sure you can tell you know, by the, the colors here, I've made borders around the same whales. So if you remember before when I did the, the doubles of the whale Echo um, and uh, the whale Nile, that you saw them in different positions, there's a lot to think about when you're tracking humpback whales and trying to look at the, the shape of their tail and the coloration of their tail and the size of their tail. You know, in, the one in red here looks like it's got wide choppy or wide thick uh, flukes, but over here, they look like they're a lot thinner and stretched out. And that I really didn't change these pictures at all. It was just foggy, crappy weather, to be honest with you. Um, but the position and the condition of the water really changes uh, what you might be able to see. So 
there really is a challenge oftentimes to, to identify whales when you're on the water with weather inside a moving object. I can't stress enough how sometimes when you're doing research on whales or just trying to show people differences between them, you, you may not know what's going on and that's totally okay. Um, but there are some matches here, our green and our green, you may be able to match up from far away. There's sort of this little spiky piece, which is this over here. Um, this whale has sort of the salt and pepper spicy thing going up here in the middle. Um, uh, this, we have our darker whale over here. And then this whale of the bunch is actually my favorite. Um, her name is Wizard. And I don't know if anybody can kind of get a sense of this small sort of ink splotch here. Uh, but if you've ever seen Fantasia or Lord of the Rings, you may know that a wizard will often wear a cap and maybe have a shield or a staff and a long cape that goes to the ground. And the person who named wizard thought that this looked like sort of a shadow or a silhouette of a wizard. A wizard is a longtime mom who came to uh, visit Stellwagen Bank and has had many calves and many years of great sightings with us. So great job in that challenge, everyone. Now, I know I talked a ton about whale tails or flukes, and that we can watch whales and check out what's happening in their tails, but sometimes whales don't dive and don't beautifully show us their back end. And we have no idea what their tail looks like. Uh, we just may not know. So there are actually other ways that we can identify uh, humpback whales as well. And one is the shape of their dorsal fin. Now I'm not gonna scramble your brain tonight and make you guess, but I do want to give you a sense uh, across the board here how the different whale tail or whale dorsal fins rather can look. Uh, some are kind of curved and pointy or falcate. Some have more of a triangle or a square shape. Some may have some color to them or some scarring. And yet others might look like they're barely there at all. Uh, for those of you who have been in a whale watch before, you may recognize a couple of these whales. Um, Thomas, you might know who music is, or for, if there were, for those of you who um, like to whale watch on the North Shore, just, just above Boston, this whale is Valley. She circulates that area a lot and is well known for being a really great mom and absolutely gigantic. Um, so these are just some examples of, of other ways that you can distinguish whales from each other. Uh, you might not be able to get exactly who they are based on their, uh, their dorsal fin shape, but Nile, for example, has two little dots that look like um, eye eye. Does anyone know what an eye eye is? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one of those funny little like a marsupial type creatures that looks like an eye eye looking at you um, through binoculars. So there are sometimes some really good examples of ways that we can get an idea of who these animals are. And even scars can tell us who a humpback whale is. Um, this seems like a very sad case because somebody wasn't too careful and bonked into a whale with their propeller. Um, but here is a well-known, and I will also add to this, a healthy survivor uh, humpback whale that was scarred by a boat propeller long ago. You can see there's some, some marks over here that look like, <laughs> I was gonna say skid marks, but what I meant to say was uh, boat propeller marks uh, that thankfully this whale was able to um, overcome. And so that's one way that we can tell who this whale is because only pleats has exactly that scar pattern. Some of them can look uh, quite similar, but that's pleats. And um, here is yet another human interaction that we have seen before. A young whale that has these sort of rope lines um, across the back here, um, accidentally entangled in some fishing gear that sort of rubbed against the body and created those unfortunately permanent marks there. But that is another way to tell one whale apart from another when they're in the water and you don't get a chance to see the tail. And sometimes you can get a good scar. Well, I, don't, I don't know that any scar is good, but sometimes you can get a scar uh, with a whale that's very recognizable even from super far away. So you've been able to see um, you know, the big whale tail. I've got one here with me as well, my model of the full whale tail with the 
the edges or the points of the lobes being completely consistent on either side. They should look like a giant B or a giant W um, with the little serrations. But here, this whale, who was named Venom for the two <laughs> bite marks here in the corner that look like this snake bite, uh, actually lost a portion of her fluke. And even from the other side, so we're looking at the ventral side here, the underside, the belly side. And over here, we're looking at the dorsal side, the darker part of her tail. And you can see even here that it looks like this portion was cut off. So venom, even if you don't get a chance to look at the snake bite over here on the left, you can still tell exactly who she is, even from a, a mile away. And I remember this, this picture off of the um, backside of Cape Cod. I took this picture about a mile away with a zoom lens, which is why it's kind of fuzzy, um, but you could even still tell really well that that is the whale named Venom. So pretty interesting that you can see these creatures uh, based on scars and markings. And even now a return to owl, you remember before owl with the two big eyes on either side um, has traveled up and down the Eastern seaboard, uh, been recognized in the Caribbean waters, the warm Caribbean waters in the winter and in the summertime to the cooler New England waters from Massachusetts to New Hampshire to Maine. She's been seen time again, but even when she does not fluke, she has this big scar in her back from when she was hit by a boat many years ago. And after that time, amazing that we see these whales travel hundreds of miles, give birth to giant babies, eat tons, literally tons of food a day. And still when something as large as a big boat in the water hits them, they can survive. It doesn't mean that they will, but it's just amazing to know that we can learn the story of these animals over time by the markings on their body, by the things that they do in the water and by um, the, the stories that they tell through their behavior, their actions, their markings. So that, that leads me to sort of tell you about the most incredibly famous whale of all time. And those of you who know anything about whales at all have probably heard about her in spades. This is the dorsal fin of a whale named Salt. And Salt is an interesting example of all that you can learn about humpback whales. She has been studied uh, more than I can say with confidence more than any other humpback whale in the entire universe of all things whale. And the reason why is because when she was coming around um, in the 1970s uh, in Cape Cod waters, one of our captains who um, was a fisherman at the time with a, a company in Provincetown, Massachusetts, noticed that this same dorsal fin kind of kept popping up and he said, huh, I think that's the same whale. And he noticed that because of her unusual markings here that almost look like they are salt sprinkled on the top of her dorsal fin. And at that time in the late 1970s, Captain Avalar said, I think I'm going to name her salt. And therefore her darker skinned neighbor became known as Pepper. So salt and pepper were seen together, uh, two humpback whales in the same water, recognizable. And at that time it was thought, no, there must be other whales who have markings that are unique to them. And so began the study of humpback whales through their pigmentation and their markings. And since that time in the 1970s, hundreds and hundreds of whales have been followed through their life and sometimes death. And we've learned a lot about them who they gave birth to, if they were a male or a female, about how long some of them live, because some of them have, have been seen again and some have not. Some have washed ashore and been recognized by those scars. We have learned time and again from whales like salt, how do they behave in the water? What are they doing there? How are they feeling these days? Are they skinny? Are they fat? Is their skin in good condition? What kind of things are they doing? You learn so much about humpback whales just by being able to track them over time that it's extremely valuable information, not just for the scientists who would like to know how to save them, but also for the people who visit them on the water or hear their stories and come to love them. Because the more that we learn about these whales, the more that we can connect to them, 
then the more that we care for them and will want to uh, be involved and take a hand in saving them ourselves. So salt is just the best example of that. And although I didn't include her tale in tonight's presentation, I did want to make sure that I mentioned her so that you can go and look up her story yourself. And now, for those of you who love whales and would like to take part, I am going to invite you to make your own splash with a whale tail challenge on social media. For those of you who are homeschooling or if you uh, like to draw outside of school, or if you're just learning about whales and you get really excited about them, I would love for you to design your own whale tail or your own fluke to share um, that would have you know, something like a shape like this with your, your points on the end and your sort of big V with the smooth bottoms and sort of ridgy top here, this area we call the serrations. And then think of a pattern and throw it on there. Someone like eruption or owl or echo and name it. And then post it to social media like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever platform you're using. And you can tag Rockland whales. If you're really young and you don't use social media, but you would like to, to take a picture, you can certainly take a picture of your artwork and send it to the Rockland Memorial Library, who would love to display your whale, or we'd just like to hear about it. So please feel free, everyone, to join us in the Whale Tail Challenge and share a fluke yourself, because it's really, really fun. Maybe someday you'll be able to get to name your own whale. So that's all I have for that. I'm going to give you one last little slide here. And then I'd like to take some time, everybody, to, um, to answer some of your questions and address some things that I might have missed in our one hour that we've had together. Um, if you want to share your challenge, you can just hashtag Rockland Wales because Rockland Memorial Library here on the South Shore in Massachusetts. Or if you have specific questions, you can email me at lindsay at northernhall.com. And of course, you always have the opportunity, if you dare, to join me on a boat somewhere on Cape Cod in the summer of 2022. Okay, 